Okay, today we're going to be transitioning in from the politics of the 1920s into what's called the Roaring Twenties. Um, <clears throat> it's the time period when there's going to be a lot of changing going on throughout America, and it's going to be that that kind of living on the edge, a little bit of a wild side issue going on during the 1920s. So in chapter 13, section 1, it's called Changing Ways of Life. And for the most part, there's going to be a lot of issues that are going to come around, but here's the objectives mostly. What we're going to talk about is the ability for Americans to express their conflicts between the customs and values, and that's going to change as the 1920s goes on. And why does it really matter? Well, we're going to learn about a lot of interesting things of kind of people versus the state and um, a big shift in values in terms of the way Americans think. And the key terms and names that we're going to see are prohibition, speakeasy, bootlegger, fundamentalism. And then we've talked a lot about the scope trial during your projects, but we're also going to touch on that as we move through this, uh, this Prezi real quick. Okay, so there's a bunch of differences between people living in rural and urban areas. So between 1922 and 1929, you're going to have this big migration of people from the smaller areas, the more rural country backwoods type situations, moving to cities. And it's going to accelerate to where there's nearly 2 million people leaving a farm and going to a bigger city um, in, in any given time. But, but during that seven years from 1922 to 1929, you're going to get around 2 million people leaving and going to bigger cities. Um, and famously, basically, what one of the things that we see is that cities were not a place to, um, they were, they were a place to be and not a place to get away from. So, people were, were going to go back from being, living out on land and into the city, city life, um, in major cities like New York and Philadelphia and Boston and Chicago and even like Cincinnati and some of the more Midwest cities. Okay, so you have this small this idea of small town life versus city life. Some of the things you're going to see in small town life are you're going to be bound by traditional morals, and what that means is that you're going to be a lot more straight laced and going to church and doing all those kinds of situations. And you're going to see a tie between families and friends and religion. They're going to be really close, where you, family is super important, and you have a small group of friends. And religion is kind of the thing that that fuels everything in terms of small town life. In the city, however, you're going to see a variety of different things going on and options and things to do and perspectives and the way people look at life is completely different in the city. So you have large mixed populations of different cultures and you're going to see a lot more tolerance in, in terms of what people can get away with and not be looked at as weird or out of the normal or that kind of stuff. So, what what I'm going to do is is one one of the popular songs of the 1920s is kind of kind of sum all this up. Is uh, I'm going to show you a YouTube clip here in a second, but one of the the famous parts of of the song is how you going to keep keep them down on the farm when they've seen Paris, which is Paris. So here's a little clip from that song of this time period. So there's that, um, and yes, I'm glad there was not a video on me because I was dancing. All right, next thing. So as you move from that, that big idea of how you're going to keep them down in the farm, how you're going to keep people in rural areas and not move into the cities, we have this new urban scene. So this idea of cities in the 1920s. You have this big population boom in New York. Um, the population is going to be 5.6 million 
in Chicago, you've got 3 million people, and Philadelphia is 2 million, and you have over 65 cities in America that have 100,000 more or more people in them. So you're going to have this big population boom uh, in the urban setting. Here's what's really good for industry and money-making purposes in, in America. The cities are going to be what's considered industrial powerhouses. And you're going to have native-born whites and African-Americans and Polacks and Irish and Russians and Italians and all of, the, all of the people that go into what's considered as this awesome manufacturer's dream where you're going to have all these different people that have different skills that can get things done. So production's going to go way up. There's going to be a lot of money made. And from then, from then on, you're going to have kind of the big cities as the industrial powerhouses of America pushing us into the, the 1930s before we have uh, the Great Depression that we're going to talk about later down the road. The city, um, and, and if, this is straight out of the book from page 435, is was basically a world of competition and change. So you have lots of people competing over different stuff, um, jobs and goods and apart places to live. And then you're going to have this ever-changing situation going on where if things need to change, they will. And so the urban scene is like this big snowball of stuff that's happening in American history. So prohibition is going to be one of those things. We've talked a lot about the 18th Amendment. And that's going to be that kind of the same idea of the small town versus big city values. So small town religious people are going to push to get rid of the cell and cons the, the consumption of alcohol. So in January of 1920, you're going to have reformers who are basically going to say that enough is enough and that liquor is the prime cause for all the corruption in the world. And so it's evil and we got to get rid of it. That's going to be the 18th Amendment. And supporters of prohibition are going to be mostly from rural south and west where there was large populations of Protestants. And Protestants, I'm not going to go into, that's more of a world history issue, but know that that's just a, a form of religion that is very prominent in American society during this time. So prohibition is going to be this huge issue from 1920 until 1933. And for the most part, there's going to be lots of things that happen. For instance, number one, the prohibition bureau, Excuse me. The Prohibition Bureau is going to be a part of the Treasury Department. So the question that I ask is, would you call that an example of big government or small government? And I'll give you just a second to think about that. Is creating a new bureau big government or small government? And the correct answer is it's big government. The more government programs you have, the, the bigger the government is. And so during this time period of... Uh, prohibition, you're going to see lots of growth in big government. So you're going to have more government agencies and more things that are controlled by the government. And that's going to cause a lot of issues that we're going to talk about as we move forward. So here's some causes and effects of prohibition. For the most part, you, you have 13 years of, of the making of alcohol and, and distributing it and selling it illegal. And on the cause side, just, just to let you know, there's various religious groups are going to say that drinking is sinful and it's causing all these problems, and then you're going to have people talk about how the public health is, is bad because of alcohol, and, and you're going to have reformers who are going to say alcohol is directly related to crime and wife and child abuse and accidents on the job, people coming to work drunk, that kind of thing. So during World War I, um, native native-born Americans develop this anger for German Americans and we talked about how the German Americans were big time brewers of alcohol mostly beer and so there's going to be this that that's a European thing we don't like them we don't like immigrants and immigrants bring alcohol in and all the, the big problems that cause from that so you're going to see that that is on the cause list the effects is that it really did the consumption of alcohol do, does decline um, there was a disrespect of the law. So before the night, before prohibition, uh, police officers didn't weren't seen as such a bad thing. But as you go through prohibition, law law officers were treated badly, mostly because 
Americans don't like to be told what to do for the most part in, the, in our history. And then you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, the thugs and smuggling and bootleggers and, and organized crime is going to become a really bad situation. And they find it as a new way of income. So people like Al Capone are going to get into the bootlegging and smuggling operation and make lots of money. So um, those are the causes and effects that we're going to talk about in terms of prohibition. Now, to kind of wrap this up, you have a situation called speakeasies. And speakeasies are um, a place where people could go and get liquor illegally. And there were these underground hidden saloons and nightclubs where you would have people go to be able to purchase alcohol illegally. And the question that I ask is, why do you think that they were called speakeasies? And if you think about that for a second, they were called speakeasies because... You, you didn't want anybody to find out about them because they were illegal. So you had to be really quiet about where they were and what, what the situation was in terms of um, going to the speakeasies because in, you're going to have, it's, it's illegal at the time. So you have lots of people that are trying to f find you out if you, have, if you either own one or you go there to buy alcohol. Okay. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that speakeasies were used by all classes of society, upper class, middle class, lower class. They were found in penthouses, cellars, office buildings, um, rental properties, tenements is where people lived that didn't have a lot of money, but you could still find speakeasies. It was like the, the, uh, the low end of, of the city where it's really cheap rent. You could still find them there. They were in hardware stores. And they were hidden all throughout American society. And it wasn't just upper class, lower class. It was everybody would have a chance to go to a different speakeasy um, throughout their big city. Even in small towns, there were speakeasies. So. And to be able to get into those, you had to, the reason, one of the reasons that they were called speakeasies is you had to either have a card that you would show as a member or you'd have a password, a secret password that would let you in to be able to go in. So here's a picture 